For the past two decades, remakes and sequels started sprouting out of the cinematic ground like weeds, with Disney being one of the major players in reviving their old films. For example, just during the last two years, there's been Dumbo, Aladdin, The Lion King and Mulan, just to name a few. These remakes obviously sell well, otherwise Disney would have stopped producing them long ago. But it's going beyond that. Sequels use the same mechanism as remakes, the strategy of appealing to our inner child by continuing stories whose predecessor came out years ago. So you're sitting there, having purchased your $10 ticket to basically re-watch a movie you've seen before, and you start asking yourself, what am I doing here? I'm Felix, and welcome to Movie Motion's Hats. Is originality in Hollywood dying? Humans are built similarly. If you go back in time and take a closer look at the history of narratives, you will start to recognize certain similarities between stories. One approach to this phenomenon became fairly famous since Star Wars. The hero's journey, popularized by American scholar Joseph Campbell. According to him, the journey of the archetypal hero is a shared trope found among mythologies all around the world. His observations were strongly impacted by the work of Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung. He studied narratives across the globe, examined religious texts, myths and fairy tales, but also dreams. By comparing them with each other, he extracted certain resemblances which can be found in most of the stories told throughout human history. This discovery shaped his theory of a collective unconscious. Young claimed that there is a shared structure of the subconscious mind between beings of the same species. What may sound mystical at first, in reality is not too much of a leap. If all humans, from the moment they are born, have a basic understanding of cause-effect correlations or share the same kind of skill set to perceive the world as three-dimensional, why not agree that not only the consciousness is similarly built across all humans, but that also the subconscious mind is? Let's take The Beauty and the Beast as an example. In 2017, Disney launched a live-action film version of their 1994 Broadway musical of the same title. This musical itself was a remake of Disney's 1991 animation hit The Beauty and the Beast. From there on, the traces blur. There are too many films with this exact title or a remarkably similar storyline. But even without the title, many elements of the plot can be found in various cultures and times. Kyle Caldren traces back the plot's foundation of The Beauty and the Beast in his series Brows Held High. Not only does he identify the plot to be implemented into more popular stories such as Bella and Edward from Twilight or Christine and the Phantom of the Opera in The Phantom of the Opera, but also in stories that date back a long time. Like a very long time. Starting at the Epic of Gilgamesh, an epic poem that dates to the 18th century, before Christ and from then on being constantly reshaped in stories such as Hades and Persephone, for example. There were plenty of reasons why this story is retold, either as a tirade against superficiality, or as a metaphor for heterosexual cisgender relationships, or as an expression of perverse lust for the forbidden. And there are certainly problematic undertones, which we as a culture have only recently come to terms with. But in any case, the basic trope is sturdy enough and culturally ingrained enough to support a multitude of interpretations and subversions over centuries of storytelling tradition. If you acknowledge that humans are quite the same when it comes to the way their subconscious mind works, it's hardly surprising that the stories this collective subconscious constructs tend to be similar. We are continuously confronted with the same reality, pose the same questions and re-encounter the same ethical and social debates as generations before us. Of course our narratives orbit the same motives, the same plots. Love, death, betrayal. Thousands of years ago these subjects may have been new or original. But ever since its creation, humankind has not changed excessively. Our stories haven't changed excessively. There is no pure originality, neither in Hollywood nor in any other narrative form. However, 
While this realization frees us from the fear of originality hanging by a thread, it changes nothing about the feeling we have. Why are we being flooded by remakes and sequels that make us feel like we are Bill Murray in Groundhog Day? Because we're supposed to. The Remake Sequel Paradox The problem with retelling an old story or continuing it is the expectation of the audience. You want the second movie to be just as good as the first one, but not the same. Like almost the same, but different. The fact that you cannot unwatch a movie makes you watch the second one, hoping that it creates the same feeling you experienced when you watched the original. This paradoxical desire of the audience makes any remake or sequel a tightrope walk for the studios. Hollywood, however, seems to have figured out the best recipe for wholesome entertainment. Let's take the material of a story everyone can relate to, add a little hero's journey to it and mix it with comic relief. There you have the ultimate Hollywood movie cake. A cake that has a cleansing effect on us by making us experience affects such as happiness, anger or shame. At least, that's how Aristotle would have described the impact of Hollywood blockbusters on us. To guarantee these effects, Hollywood is always on the lookout, trying to find the perfect recipe, the ideal formula. So when Campbell provided the ideal structure of delicious cake, filmmakers realized that they'd only need to take that very same structure of the hero's journey and adjust it a little, simply by sprinkling some of their own content on top. Yet people started recognizing that Hollywood cakes started to resemble each other more and more, so that Hollywood tried to step up its game by looking for a new ingredient. And what did they find? Childhood. The importance of childhood on the remake sequel experience. Hollywood learned that film could not only evoke emotions by making the audience identify with protagonists and their emotions inside a hermetically sealed narration, but that they also could include the experience the audience had already acquired by watching similar films. How could you appeal any better to feelings such as carefree happiness when the last time you really experienced them was as a child? Remakes and sequels situate themselves within your lifetime and make use of their capacity to recall certain periods of your life. Because our grandparents didn't grow up watching Sunday morning cartoons, they never got to experience the feeling of re-watching those childhood favorites as adults and immediately being transferred back. So this feeling of, haven't I seen this somewhere before, is caused by two factors. A. Thanks to most of Hollywood's films since Star Wars, you've gotten used to movies being structured around the hero's journey, anticipating every story beat long before the film reveals them to us, and B. If it's a remake, you literally have seen the story before, because Hollywood's trying to appeal to your inner child and feelings connected to it. This raises the question, why bother watching them then? To answer that, let's take a closer look at one character from Disney's latest remake of The Beauty and the Beast. Did you notice that Gaston's companion Le Fou now carries a lot more traits that are typically associated with homosexuality compared to its predecessor. He even wraps himself up in Gaston's strong muscular arms before pausing and asking him Too much? Yep. In the 26 years that passed between these two movies, the queer discourse has increasingly gotten more relevant to the social discourse of our times and thus shaped the perspective of the second movie. One man openly admiring another one with this ardor? Of course, there's a gay implication today that was ignored or not seen in 1991. Since movies are always part of the culture and times from which they emerge, it's nearly impossible to realize a remake or a sequel without updating the original movie and interpreting it from a new perspective. This creates the unique possibility to point to certain deficiencies in society. So, is originality in Hollywood dying? As we have seen, no story is completely new, because humans aren't so different from each other after all. If you see it from this point of view, there's never been originality. But I like the other take on this question. If you acknowledge that you've seen most of Hollywood stories already, you stop clinging to the what and start paying attention to the how. 
Hollywood uses your childhood as a source of emotions instead of solely forming them out of the narration. Yet some story arcs really needed to be updated because they held on to values that we as society have overcome for a long time. This makes you reflect on things you took over without thinking first. Filling old plots and stories with new perspective creates a valuable contribution to public discourse because it makes you see things in a new light, even if it's just a small thing as a slight change of dialogue. If an old story makes you reflect on certain things in a new way, because it's enriched with perspective, how could it be anything but original? <laughs> the silence. Finally, he's done talking. Did you notice how much nicer the parts were in which Felix wasn't talking? I reckon these brief moments of bliss are worth a like and subscribe. Let me also give you the small piece of advice. There is another side to this story. A more realistic side. A more truthful side. So if you're ready to leave this fairy tale video behind, just click the link and check out my side of the coin.